The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by the United American Costume Company. Our guest today is American costume designer for film and television, Daniel Orlandi who regularly collaborated with directors James Mangold, Joel Schumacher, Ron Howard, and John Lee Hancock. Born in New Jersey, Orlandi graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and began working off-Broadway. He relocated to Los Angeles in 1980. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the humbly talented Daniel Orlandi to the Designing Hollywood Podcast Show. Good day, sir. It is great to have you here. Welcome. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, listen, let me let me ask you. I got to, you know, you, you came out of Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. Yes. How do you go from university to becoming a Hollywood costume designer, working with some of the greatest actors and directors in the business? How does that happen? Uh, well, here's the thing. When you, when I went to college, to Carnegie Mellon, I met my best friends and I met my tribe people that love the same things I did. Sets, costumes, sets, costumes, uh, theater, movies, uh, which I never had had before. Uh, they're still my best friends. Uh, and I worked with two friends from college uh, right after school. And we um, worked for public television. Wow. Uh, in New York, doing the lowest budget little mini series, uh, you know, where we did the visual effects, the props, everything. Uh, and then we said, hey, all of our friends in LA are working so much more than we are. And I was a set designer. And uh, we moved to Los Angeles, the three of us across the country, and we got this apartment, you know, with no security deposit. And back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> and we, and I am, I almost, Within a few months, I somehow fell into this job being Bob Mackey's assistant on a film. You're kidding. With no film, real film experience. Well, I have to ask what the film was. It was Pennies from Heaven. With Not, Bernadette Peters with and Steve Martin? Nine months on that film as Bob's assistant. Uh, I learned so much so quickly. I mean, the first day of my job, I almost got fired because I made a big mistake. Uh, <laughs> but then I stayed with him for six years as his assistant. My God. Okay. And that film had to have been trial by fire because the costumes in that movie oh, were amazing. Amazing. He did such a beautiful job. Um, yeah, and the production design, it was Ken Adam designed of it. Of the Bond, James Bond films. Of the James Bond films and-, and Dr. Strangelove Dr. for Kubrick. Stra yeah, Kubrick, yeah. So it was magical. So I got to ask you, how did you almost get fired? Well, we're driving my first day and I didn't even have a car. <laughs> and I'm driving Bob in his car. And he said, now when we show the sketches to the director, I'm like, oh, was I supposed to bring the sketches? Oh, God. <laughs> and the end of the day, we turned around and got the sketches. And, you know, he said, so tell me, why am I not firing you? <laughs> and did you have an answer? I did. I said, because I'll never, ever do that again. <laughs> and did he buy it? And then it? he became he a really it. good assistant because I stayed with him, you know, on every project he did. I mean, full time for him for six and a half years. My God. Uh, so for those of you who don't know Bob Mackey's name, shame on you. But what was it like, I mean, working with somebody like him, who a legend, obviously, what were some of the lessons that he imparted to you about the craft that you were later, uh, later able to apply yourself? Oh, about how to make somebody look as good as they possibly could. Uh, yeah, because we would see a movie and he'd say, well, you know, I couldn't do that movie because she looks so terrible. And she's <laughs> supposed to look terrible, but it would just offend me. Uh how, but were there techniques? Were there? Were oh there... yeah, you know they. The I learned so much about how to make a dress, how to uh, so much, how to work with an actor, uh, how to listen to an actor, how to guide them. Uh, you know, he was a workaholic. He and his partner uh, Ray Agian, who was the first costume designer whose name I ever knew. 
<laughs> as a kid because he had designed some crazy Doris Day movies in the 60s. Wow. And as a little kid, I'm like, oh, yeah, that looks great. Now, when you were working with him, did you fanboy out? Did you say, listen, you were the first? Of course. I, yes. Ray. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, but it was when I first moved here with my two friends, we had this, we had a refrigerator and we had put a poster on the wall. And every time we saw a celebrity, we'd write their name down. Well, like two weeks working at Bob Mackey's, I filled the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> because everybody came in there from Joan Rivers to Diana Ross to Carol Burnett to, uh, you know, it was amazing. Well, you know, having this kind of background, one of the things that I've always been fascinated by, I was telling you this when we first met, I've always believed that some of the most important hires on any movie are the makeup people, the hair people, and the costume designer. Because you you have to have your actors feeling that when they wa walk out on set in front of a camera, they have to know they look good. And, and a costume designer is one of those the most important people because actors have to love their wardrobe and also the character is usually defined by what an actor wears. And I'm curious from your perspective, you have worked on period pieces, you've worked on modern thrillers, you've worked on superhero films which are so popular now. What is your process when you when you get to a project if it comes across your desk, what attracts you to a project? And how do you begin your process designing the film? Does it come out of who's cast in it? Does it come from the uh, director? Or is it the script that inspires you? Where do you begin? Well, you always start with the script. I read the script and I, I don't like to have too much of a definite idea till I know who's cast uh, because I want them to be involved. I was a set designer and realized how much I really like working with actors making making the character. And every little detail is important. And working early in my career with Robert De Niro, he taught me how the socks are important. Really? Yeah. Because in the morning, you know, his costume would be in the room and he'd like call me over and said, are these the socks we decided? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> every detail. He, he, he would try on a thousand things. And this was for Flawless? For Flawless. Well, it, but the first time I worked with him, I co-designed a movie called The Fan. Uh, was, that, was that Tony Scott? Tony Scott's The yeah. Fan? Yeah. Because there was oh. the Lauren Bacall, The Fan, yeah. earlier oh, before no, that. Yeah. People always said, oh, did you? No, no, I didn't. So you did worked that. for Tony Scott on The Fan, yes. And it was we had such a good time on that. And matter of fact, he remembered me and um, Tribeca hired me to, to do a miniseries that he he produced. Wow. So that yeah. obviously made an impression. Hence, yeah. costume designers out there, it's important to uh, get those actors under your thumb. Yeah. No, it's important to make them feel like the character. Yeah. And, you know, when we did Flawless, we did this little thing where all of the costumes were bought within walking distance or uh, of where the location where he lived. That's fantastic. So the Army Navy store, and and I bought some stuff on the street from somebody, uh, and I, he liked that idea. So you you start with a script, but then you wait until it's cast to really to, to e individual your characters. Ideas. Yeah, and I've done a lot of movies about real people, so you want to be as truthful as possible to to the the person that you're portraying and making that making the actor feel like that person, not doing an impersonation. Right. Now, how do, how do the clothes, how does your costume work help an actor do that? Is it better if they know like, well, this is the actual fabric that they used in the clothes this person wore? Do you go that deep? Yes. Sometimes, if, if possible. Yes. And you, you have the pictures and you have the, you know, the internet now is so helpful in, you know, looking up somebody. You can, you know, find articles about somebody and pictures. And, uh, but I, I don't, for the most part, you don't want it to be exact. It doesn't have to be exact because the actor is different than the character. The, right. But making them feel like the character. And, uh, you know, when we did Frost Nixon, it was very interesting because Frank Langella looks nothing like Richard Nixon. Sure. But Ron Howard did a really interesting trick. We don't see Nixon. We hear him first. For like the first five minutes, we only hear him and we see like newsreel footage. And then we slowly get used to his voice. And then we see him far away. And then as we get closer and you're already 
settled into this is Richard Nixon. I, I first of all, I love Frank Langella. I yeah. got to meet him on Superman Returns, and I thought he was great. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yes, he doesn't look like he's a lot taller than Richard Nixon in real life. Yes, and there's just he has, but he has a great presence. And I thought he, I thought he was actually. You have Anthony Hopkins who played Nixon in yes. Nixon, but I thought Langella, Langella did a great job. Yeah. I mean. Well, and that was well, his Nixon was a little more malevolent. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, I think that's an interesting when you're doing real people. Yeah, I let's go back to something like when you work with James Mangold on Ford v Ferrari. Uh-huh. I love that film because you you were sort of bridging two worlds. You had the race. The, the the racing world, yes, and then you had the executives, yes. you know the the people w- in their suits, yeah, and so you really had a contrast in costuming in that film, and I really loved, like, I wanted all the wardrobe that a lot of the the, the race, anybody involved in making the cars, I wanted to like wear what you, and I just thought the clothes in that movie were great, the, oh and great, that, that contrast, I loved it. So when you're doing something like that, obviously that film. It, it, it there was a design ethic that, like you said, it doesn't have to be exact, but you it almost is like you had a there was a realism there, but it felt a bit heightened, like it, like there was a bit of nostalgia for how we thought that time period looked when we were watching the movie, and I thought it worked great. I don't know if that's true, maybe that was just me, but what's it like when you're working with a movie that has two different worlds, two very different worlds oh, that frequently clash? It was really a fun project because I worked very closely with the production designer, and we gave. The Ford executives a look, the um, the Shelby crew a look, and then we all three big uh, race uh, scenes all have different looks. We have, you know, we have Willow Springs, which is California sunshine, Beach Boise, and then we go to uh, Daytona, uh, which is a little more redneck, right? And East Coast, and then we go to Le Mans, which is northern France in the sixties, which is sort of still the fifties, right? Right, and it's sort of darker and browner and uh, and more conservative. And then we also had the Ferrari guys compared to the Ford guys, and those the the Ferrari guys were more old world browns, rich textures, and the uh, and the Ford guys are all sort of space age silver cool well i really thought that that really came through in in the film so when you when you have this was this approach was this something that you would you, would you come up with this with the production design and the art department team and then bring it to the director or was this a synergistic thing that the mangold you and the art department all came up with together all came up together but i would say the production design and or designer and i did it sort of on the sly a little bit really to to make our colors all sort of feel right together well that was you know that was one of my my big questions to you is how closely do you work with the production designer because obviously color and texture is a huge part of how a movie looks and when you have actors walking through sets and you might want to have complementary colors yeah. or colors that stand out what is that relationship that you have with the production designer? I love working with the production designer. I and I I'm disappointed when the production designer really doesn't want to. Uh so when you work with a production designer uh that does it, it's so great. Cause we did a I did a 60s takeoff on a Doris Day movie. Uh and the production designer and I work so closely, like the color of of his vest matches the wall. Exactly. <laughs> the color of her suit is the same fabric that's on the sofa. Wow. Uh, so to give it that sort of completely realistic, unrealistic look of a Doris Day movie. Uh, and it was so much fun to do. No, and, I think that's essential. That would yeah. be essential. How could you how could a production designer not want to to yeah. come up with that that with you. Sometimes they're just too busy and they sh- you know send you the stuff but you know you don't get a lot of conversation uh but sometimes you do and I really really enjoy it because I I think that's the best thing about filmmaking it's so collaborative now, with t- the t- actors and the hair and makeup and the director and the production designer and the cinematographer. That's what I was going to ask you. Uh does the cinematographer come into play as well like when you're oh, working yeah. with the production designer? Oh yeah. Do you talk to the DP before you start shooting? Oh, in yeah, terms of color. Definitely. And we do screen tests and color tests and they look at fabrics. So I'm like, no, that's going to strobe. Don't please don't use that. Right. Right. And then you try not to use it. 
Well, I mean that that kind of I think that kind of synergy is absolutely the way you have to approach these kinds of projects. Yeah. N- now, when you did something like Ford v Ferrari, and you said you did this on the sly. Well, we did it. The director was far away from us. We were out in the valley, and he was over at Fox. So we would have these conversations about color and. And Jim's great to work with. Uh, you know, I got to work with him twice, and it was, you know, two really, really great projects that he wrote. Now, with that project in particular, you're talking about sourcing fabrics, and you're talking about oh, yeah. finding different styles, um, literally all over the world, different eras. How do you go about finding? Are you making everything from scratch? No. Uh, we made, I, we, you know, we made our leads clothes and all, you know, we had to make all of the racing uniforms and we had to make different kinds. We had to make ones that were for the actors. We had to make ones that looked just like the real ones. But then for the stunt drivers, they had to be uh, Nomex and because they didn't have, they didn't have that uh, fireproof fabric back then. <laughs> right. They, you know, the joke was uh, race car drivers don't retire. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we met uh, a man who actually owns the Beverly Hills um, Rolls Royce Repair on Santa Monica Boulevard. And he was 17 and worked for Shelby and went to Le Mans. And he had one of the shirts, which we he wouldn't let us keep or right. hold on to. But we went there and photographed it and measured it and measured the embroidery. And his wife, and I said, don't you have any of the jackets? And his wife looked at me and said, no, he was a young guy and he gave them to all the girls he dated. <laughs> well, you, you've you also worked a lot with the same directors, yes. you know, which is a testament to you. Obviously, your talent is recognized and people want to bring you back. What are the relationships that you have with the directors that you work with in terms of so... When you're brought on a project, do you sit down and, and talk with the director first and, and sort of you've, you said the script is where it all begins. Yes. But then when you work with the director, do you have preliminary conversations with with them about? Oh, yes, absolutely. How, absolutely. Does, how does that go? Like, do they ever sketch things for you? No, but you discuss it with the production designer. We'll have like a meeting. You know, when I worked with John Lee Hancock, I worked with the same production designer and almost always the same cinematographer. And we'll have the meeting and, you know, sit at lunch and just talk about what the director's thinking. Right. And who is he thinking of casting and where they might be shooting. And so you really get a sense of how he's feeling about of the project now do they do directors tend to give you carte blanche so once you start working they trust you they don't they don't micromanage what you're doing sometimes they do really oh yeah <laughs> some it's di- different directors work a different way and i'm i work the way the director wants to work he's in charge so if he wants to micromanage and look at every little thing um i'm fine with that too well that but I, sometimes they don't you know, they want you to do the, co- I mean, I've worked with an actor once and I was like, well, what do you think? And he's like, well, just tell me what I should wear. That's it. Yeah. And and when, do you like that? When's- no, I like talking about, you know, sometimes at the last minute, it's like, great. But no, I love actors that it's a give and take. And it's like, oh, but what if I had this? And what if I had that? Uh, what you know when you just talk about the character and it's like oh yeah he would have beat up shoes I did a project uh, for Ryan Murphy and a lot of the characters were sort of based on real people and uh, one of the guys came in to be an actor in the play in the thing and I said well you know on um, on Christopher Street there used to be an Army Navy store and I think that's where your character probably bought his clothes so it's like an old jeans and you probably had a plaid shirt because it was popular and you got some old vintage tie and everything and then he went to meet the real guy and he called me and he said he really did buy his clothes there <laughs> and I was like yes <laughs> well then in a way you're kind of even functioning as a writer oh, where yeah. you're coming up with a backstory of a character and or a psychologist <laughs> right. you know figuring out the character how dirty are they You know, (laughs) oh, your shirt would be old. (laughs) You know, I love this idea. Now, when you're designing a film, do you work a lot? Are you making tear sheets from magazines? Are you going and getting pictures off the Internet? What is your process in terms of how do you how do you begin? 
Well, it's every project is different. You know, if it's a, a project about real people or a real period, you start doing the research of the period. Um, and I, the internet has changed our lives. It's so much easier. I used to, you know, sit for hours in the library, you know, going through and bringing it up to the Xerox machine and making copies. And now you can just find it online. But I still find myself going to Western Costume and sitting and looking at Time Magazine from 1936, you know, and looking at just pictures of real people and news stories. And then I get lost, read some story that has nothing to do with what, <laughs> what <laughs> you, my project's about, but it's so interesting. And there, But there's inspiration there too. You never yeah. know reading. Oh, it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Speaking of that, like a, a film where I thought, again, the costumes were impeccable, Saving Mr. Banks, you know, where you're dealing with one of the, the, the great entertainment figures of the 20th century, who also is very familiar to people growing up because he hosted how many TV shows? I mean, how, how many filmmakers later became pop culture figures where they're, they're coming into your house every week on television? And that's what Walt Disney was doing. So, and, and John Lee Hancock, you know, you're working with a collaborator of yours that you frequently work with. What was it like? And you're dealing with Emma Thompson as well. I mean, so you have these, these, these great, these two great actors that are iconic. Um, what was it like working on that particular film? And, and how did you approach it with John Lee Hancock? Okay. And was it cast beforehand? Uh, I think we knew Emma Thompson and Tom Hanks were going to be in it. Uh, when I started, uh, it was such a gift. It was one of the most fun, you know, one of the most fun days I've ever had on a film set was the first day we shot at Disneyland. <laughs> and we had 800, maybe a thousand extras and we had fit them all. But a lot of the crew members, families came to be extras. <laughs> So their kids were there and and it was to see the contrast of the way we dress people in 1961 going to Disneyland, uh, you know, ties and the kids are dressed up with little hats and nobody's walking around with a soda or right. a hot dog. And uh, they're just happy to be there and there's no souvenirs, you know, running around. And then to see the real people come in when we were shooting, <laughs> uh, it was like such a contrast. And, and the crew members that grew up in California was like, oh my God, it's just like the first time I went to Disneyland with my dad. And uh, but it was it was problematic. You know, we had to make all the walk around characters from, right. from the 60s because apparently they don't exist or they were not willing to share them with us. <laughs> the Disneyland people and the Disney film people don't really like each other. Really? No. Well, I can only imagine. I mean, they wouldn't close the park for you. No. <laughs> they leave Disneyland, the park open. Disneyland <laughs> closed for the second time for the pandemic. <laughs> the first time they, they closed was when John F. Kennedy died. And the next time they closed was the pandemic. So 1963, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Never a closed day since. Never a closed day. Now, well, uh, again, you know, you're dealing with an iconic figure yes. in Walt Disney yes. who who his clothing was, I mean, so many examples of what he wore. And, yeah. and he really was everyone. I mean, maybe not so much now because he yeah. left us in 1966. Yeah. But at the time, he was one of the most famous people in the world. So how do you as a costume designer... How do you bring your magic to a character that do you have any creative? Well, it was input? interesting because all we see him is in a suit. We don't see him at home. We don't see him. The only thing we gave him was a, he had a house at Smoke Tree Ranch in Palm Springs, and we gave him the Smoke Tree Ranch uh, crest on his tie, which he did wear. Uh, and it's funny because we, even the Disney archives, are like, can we look at a suit? And they're like, we don't have a suit. When he died, his wife gave everything to the Salvation Army, like people did back then. Sure. Like, they didn't think that it needed to be in a museum. No Academy, no, the, the no. Motion Picture Academy has no. no suits from Walt Disney. No. So then where do you begin? Well, we look at pictures and we made him, a, you know, a 1960s, a conservative suit. Uh, but the Emma Thompson character really had to veer away from the real woman a little because the way it's in the script, she'd not really ever been to America, but she had been to America and she'd been to Santa Fe and had all of these silver bracelets from Santa Fe, but we didn't want to have that. So I, they lent us from George Jensen 
this beautiful uh, Art Nouveau uh, silver, big silver bracelets that we use those, and they were European. And uh, and it was fun to work with Emma Thompson because she was just the greatest. Well, I can only imagine. She was just the greatest. It was so much fun because at first, our, on our first fitting, she came in and just had her own hair. And one of the producers was like, she looks too good. And uh, the other producer, the creative producer said, we'll take care of it. Uh, and she And we got her like a little crazy, ugly wig to put on for the fittings. Wow. And then they liked everything. Now, when you're when you're dealing with, I mean, obviously they're like superstars, yeah. And Tom Hanks is, yeah. d- two Academy Awards yes. under. When a when an actor like him, when he comes in, how collaborative is he with you? Uh, well, I've worked with him a few times. Uh, here's the thing: it, it it it's an odd thing is that he wears uh, three different suits, so it was a suit that fit well and look like the character and it was more about the makeup and hair getting the mustache and sure and all of that right so the suit fit and he you know was very happy to wear it so colin farrell's also in the movie and he's one of my favorite people i've ever worked with well Um, and you work with him on phone booth phone booth yes and he had to have he had to like that that suit because (laughs) he wears it well the funny thing about that thing was dolce gabbana made the suit for us and we were supposed to have six multiples because he gets shot twice. <laughs> right. We only had one suit for the whole shoot. Thank God we shot it. They never, they're, oh, they'll be here tomorrow. Oh, they'll be here tomorrow. Oh, they'll be here tomorrow. And we sort of quickly made a facsimile just in case that we had to. Uh, and it was so lucky because we shot it in order. Uh, that Okay. Now, I think explain to the viewers or the listeners at home <laughs> Why it is that you can't just have one suit for a movie? When someone gets shot, they might want to shoot him a second time. Yeah. So were you in that particular I case? I had no night sleep ever. <laughs> I mean, that had to have been when you were embarking on that. Yeah, I would never told the director. Nobody knew. Oh, my God. Nobody knew. And then, of course, you have a pretty good cameo at the end of the an actor that yes, like has one walks by. You know? We shot that a year later because it was another person doing the voice, and they didn't like the voice. <laughs> and then, because he was an old friend of Joel Schumacher's, who had given him one of his first jobs, uh, he came to do it. Yeah, I mean, they worked together on the Lost Boys. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're eating maggots, Michael. <laughs> yeah, so so it was fun, and we shot that whole movie in eleven days. And with one suit the whole time? One suit the whole time. Were you washing it at the end of every day? No, because it's a suit. You can't really wash it. Yeah, I didn't think you so. sort of brush it off. Uh, oh, man. It was great. But the fun thing, too, was that all of the extras, we shot one day in New York, walking through Times Square, and then he turns down an alley, and then the rest were shot here, downtown LA to be New York. And all of the extras, we had about 300 extras out on the street in a fancy hotel and all these things that you don't really see. But none of them knew the script. So when the gunfire starts, everybody dropped. And the, and the extras are like, what happens next? I can't wait. <laughs> so it was really fun. It was, it was you know, when Joel's the greatest uh, oh, God. cheerleader for people and he just keeps the set lively and fun. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting about about your career too, obviously comic book movies since 2008 uh-huh. and the Marvel Cinematic yeah. Universe has, has dominated the world. But people forget that really the modern comic book era really began in 2000 with the X-Men, uh-huh. with Brian Singer's X-Men yeah. that later other directors took over. And then, yeah. of course, James Mangold, who you work with on Ford v. Ferrari, he yeah. came in and did The Wolverine. And yes. then he did one of the great comic book movies of all time, which I think is Logan. And- Doing Logan, you had Patrick Stewart coming back playing Professor X, and of course you had Hugh Jackman playing Logan himself. Yeah. When you got that job, you know suddenly you're going to be. It was a comic book movie set in the real world, but now you've got a, a huge legacy of of the comic books. Yeah. And um, what was it like for you? Jumping into the fictional universe of the X Men, did you know anything about the X Men? No. 
<laughs> it's okay. No, no, asking. I, I mean, I had seen clip parts of them and I was honest in my interview and I said, oh, yeah, I've seen, you know, bits. And, and, and Jim was like, better because we don't want it to look anything like those movies. Oh, well, and you had you had one of my favorite character actors, Richard E. Grant, is in that uh, movie too. Yes. And you had uh, assassins and mutant assassins, and then you had, of course, Professor X and and Logan. Yeah. But you didn't get to go full on. That came later when yeah. you got to do some full on comic book costumes in in, in X Men. But even in X Men, there's there they have one uniform, and it's very basic. The right. director wanted it. We, but Logan was really fun for me to do because there were some concept art for the for the villains and the and the and I saw them and I I everything I had talked to the director in our first meeting before he hired me was like do you want it to look like this and he's like no 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 so our bad guys uh the mutants we did it all from the army navy store and just sort of pieced it together on each person as they were cast wow. uh, and it was really kind of fun to just cobble it all together and i'm like you know tying stuff together and like oh what about we put this thing on and 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 it was really kind of fun to do uh, it looked but right. it I mean, all it we great. had to ground it real it all was you know very realistic and 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 hugh wears a black suit through most of the movie there was like a someone and then he buys an outfit they go to like the casino when they buy an outfit and one of the um studio executives wanted it to be a funny outfit like oh it's a you know it's a country western store he should like have a wild shirt and i'm like logan would not buy a wild shirt <laughs> no and he's trying to blend in and it became this thing and finally you know it was like should it be this shirt or that shirt or this shirt and and we finally decided we went a little bit halfway and gave him sort of this gray right. Western shirt instead of a black one. Now, you know, after doing Logan, which also was one of the first comic book movies to receive an Academy Award nomination yeah. for screenplay. Yes. You jump in and you do X-Men Dark Phoenix yes. and you go full on X-Men costumes. I mean, that was it, back to the comic book. And yeah. you sp there was a very specific in the beginning of the movie when they go on that mission yes. and they rescue the space yes. shuttle. Yes. There's a very specific X costume that you went back to. I think it was Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly's run on the comics. Yes. And you were inspired by that. I yes. love what you did. Like, oh, good. I, I'm a lifelong X-Men comic book okay. fan. And so seeing what you were doing, I'm like, oh my God, they're you know, you've. What was that like for you, having done Logan? Now you're going the other direction, where it's not as realistic. It's not this sort of dystopian uh -huh. near future. You're going full on X Men canonical comic book. What was it like for you to go the well, other way? Well, it's all really grounded. Our director wanted everything really plain, mm. really, really plain. There was a whole part of the script that never got filmed that I was so excited about. And we had about 50 designs for uh, the Hellfire Club in the 90s. That was, I was so excited to do. We had bought all the fabric, waiting for the casting, and then it got cut out. How could they have cut out the Hellfire Club? I think it was a Disney thing, and I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It could have had to do with the New Mutants. Yeah. And I was very disappointed. I can. Uh, I, I'm disappointed now hearing this. Sorry. I love the Hellfire Club. Yeah, well, I was so excited. We had clothes that were going to change color, and but doing that, I mean, still, you still there was still a lot of the classic. It's very basic, and when they're not in that uniform, and everybody has the same uniform, there's no no different. Uh, they're basically in jeans yeah. and t-shirts. It's very. It's. Did you get a choice because there's so many different eras of X-Men costumes and that was a very specific era of X-Men costumes that was specific to a certain writer artist team. When uh -huh. you were looking back into the X-Men history, were you given a choice? Did you present we, different ideas? Yeah, we presented different ideas because originally he wanted it even plainer than that. Oh. And I said, well, let's at least put the X on it. And then we weren't going to even have it be the two colors. We, he wanted it sort of one color. And then finally, I had these sketches done and we did the color and we did like so many variations of a dark blue with a dark gold. And a, and we we went on the, the bolder. 
Well, kudos to you for doing that because this X Men fan got really excited when yeah. I got to see those first. Some people thought it, you know, that costume wasn't fancy enough because the ones right before at the end of the movie they put on these wild yeah apocalypse leather. went all the way they yeah. went full on yeah no but i thought what you did was great because it was it was exactly from a very specific era of yes. the x-men i'm like that's i thought it was very cool good and, and my made opinion them matters piece, so they were easy to wear they could go to the bathroom sure uh, <laughs> well you know I, I i find it interesting that throughout your career you've jumped between fantasy history and even thrillers like yeah. uh the little things the latest film you did with john lee hancock which obviously debuted it was one of the first movies that hbo max put out day and date in the theater and on hbo max you know you went a little bit it's really interesting how that script got made like we were talking about it's 30 years old a 30 yeah. year old script that john lee hancock had written back in the day that was going to get made that ended up not getting made and then was able to say hey you know warner executives there's a yeah. script that you own Let's go make this. And then you suddenly are working with Denzel Washington and Jared Leto, who are going mano y mano in this in this story. What and was Rami Malek. Yeah, and Rami Malek, who's now the villain on in No Time to Die. I know, I can't wait. I can't I cannot wait. Yeah, so too. you've got you've got these Academy Award winners, a triptych of Academy yeah. Award winning actors, uh all all uh together. Yeah. Was that ever do you ever get intimidated? When someone puts out their Oscar on the on the ground, do you do you, do you think like, my God, I'm now dealing not just with one Oscar winner but three? Uh, no, I have to say no. Uh, you know, you're always nervous. Are they going to be nice? Are they going to yell at me? Um, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I I you know what I I I'm there to service them to help sure. them be the character. And you know, I worked with an actor once, and they said he was going to be difficult. I said, if he wants to try in a tutu, I'm happy to try it on. I'll try anything, just as long as they're open to trying on maybe something that I'm thinking. Wow! So it was no no intimidation at all, and you're working with all three of them. No, I was lucky too because John Lee loves to come to the first fitting. Uh and and you've got the director there, like being the cheerleader. Right. Uh, and it's it's great. Now, when you're dealing with actors like that, now yes. obviously we talked earlier yeah. about how actors have to be comfortable in their costumes. Do you come with a, a number of alternatives? Do you give them like... Well, first, yeah. If we do sketches, we show them the sketches. I'll send them the sketches. I used to, before the internet, I would make a book of research for the actors. Wow, okay. Uh, of pictures, like if they're playing a real person and all pictures of the person throughout... And if not, I, I'll send them. Yeah, I, I like to give them before I meet them and I like to have a conversation to know what they're thinking. Uh, so you really get in their heads and get on the same page before. Oh, yeah. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel protected. I th You know, people like you meet like people like, oh, I could be an actor. It's like, no, you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Acting is hard. I mean, it is I couldn't hard. be an actor. I could never be an actor. I can I can't even be an extra. <laughs> now, when you when you're dealing with that, is there a back and forth between you and the oh, actor? Oh, absolutely. So that you don't have a problem when they're giving they they might have a certain very strong point of view. Have you ever found yourself in conflict with an actor where you think that what they want is contrary to yes, the film? Yes, of course. And, and how it's do you... usually an actor that has two lines in the movie? Of course it is. Because they say, who is the most difficult? I'm like, I could give you 20 names and you wouldn't know who any of them were because they had two lines in a movie and they had nothing to think about except that to torture me. <laughs> and those two lines might be the only two lines they ever say. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. well, like dealing with, with celebrities like the Robert De Niro on the socks yeah. thing, is there other examples of, of that where – like a watch, for instance, or a ring. It's like the one thing sometimes that makes them feel like, oh my God, that's, I'm the character now. You know, and it's an aha moment uh, in wow. a fitting. Uh, I'll tell you an example. We did The Blind Side with John Lee Hancock and uh, Sandra Bullock is playing Leanne Tui, the real woman. And I had a conversation with her and she said, I want to look exactly like her. And we photographed Leanne Tui's closet and we got the eve, the nightgowns that she wore and all of these sort of bright colors and patterns that she likes and and everything. And in our first fitting, we had all of these clothes and it just 
made her look so vulgar <laughs> and wrong. <laughs> and what we tried on something that was cream colored. And it's like, oh, we took out all the color and pattern out of her costumes. And it was sort of cream and beige and sort of navy blue. And then all of a sudden the character really worked. And the clothes could be a little too tight and a little too short. And she still, you know, and it worked rather. And it it was like the aha moment. It's like, ah, no color. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly what the person wore. It and, doesn't. But and, she captured the essence of Leanne Tui. Now, when that's going on and you're yeah. noticing this, yeah. did Sandra Bullock understand that as she well? She noticed it right away. She you know, she was putting it on. It's like, I just feel ridiculous. Right. And I'm like, you look ridiculous. <laughs> but I didn't say it out loud. Now, but were you able, were you able, I'm, I'm curious from a from a design standpoint, uh -huh. could you tell right away when she was putting that on the first fitting? That first fitting, we tried some stuff on, yeah, that doesn't look good. That doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel right. And then we tried on this cream colored outfit and it's like, oh yeah. Is there a frustration? Do you ever get frustrated? Like, do you, have, can you, do you always know immediately that it doesn't work? No, no. Sometimes you think about it and, you know, you'll do a first fitting and then reevaluate and come back in. I think we can do better. Wow. Okay. You know? Even when I do like historical things and you're designing, I don't like to present an actor the sketch, this is your costume. Except like X-Men where you're designing a uniform and, you know, that's a uniform. It's like I want them to feel part of it and then we'll do the sketch after the first meeting and then right. we'll do the sketch and make the clothes. Now, do you sometimes ever do something exploratory where you don't have maybe necessarily a, a fixed point of view where an actor comes in you're like, here's an array of things I want to oh, try? Oh, yeah. I like an array of things. Matter of fact, even um, even in Ford versus Ferrari, uh, Matt Damon playing Shelby, the director was like, I want it to be a bit more outrageous, his clothes. Uh, and we tried it on and it was like, no. And we pulled it back. And after the first day of shooting, Jim was like, oh, no, he doesn't need any of that. He doesn't need the big Western belt buckle. He does not need that. Right. Right. Now, now. Do you know that already? And you just have to let the Matt direct. Matt Damon knew. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, he, and it just people have to come to the realization uh, yeah. on their own. Yeah. No, it was it was great because you you want the character really to work, and uh, yeah, Matt Matt Damon's one of my most favorite actors that I admired so much before working with him because I always think he disappears into his roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, so I was really excited to work with he, him. So when, when that happens, when you, you have a synergy or you yeah. have a, you, you work with an actor that suddenly yeah. is like, oh my God, he's just like I wanted him to yeah. be, or I, she's yeah. just like I wanted her to yeah. be. How does that make your job easier as a costume designer? When you, when you, when you have somebody who's really open to you and, and things like that? I don't, I, I'm open to them. Okay. So. It doesn't matter to me. You know what I mean? It's nice when you're on the same page right away and you feel really comfortable like Emma Thompson, you know, in Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, but I want them to feel, I feel very protective of an actor and I want them to completely feel like the character. That, I mean, I think that's probably, you know, the crux of, of what you do. Yeah. And I have to ask you, because uh, one of the things we want to uh, talk about is hopefully inspire people to who want to get into the profession. Uh -huh. what, are, what are some things that you could impart, some of your, your wisdom of this business for people that are aspiring designers or uh -huh. stylists? What are some of the things that people should really know about working in this business? I think a good education for everybody working in any facet of the business. So you can talk intelligently about things and maybe not even the movie. Mm. You know what I mean? To just have a good conversation with people. I think you, as a costume designer, if you want to do period films, you should have a nice background in, in historical costume and how to sketch and how to draw, how to, you know. Uh, and then also when you're starting out, I mean, I was always the person who said, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Because I worked as an assistant a lot uh, for Bob 
for six and a half years, and then I assisted a bunch of other designers. Uh, and I could do, I would always do whatever they they didn't want to do it. Oh, I'll do it. And I could, you know, and I appreciate when I have some young people coming in and you say, oh, we need to do this. And they'll like, oh, I'll do it. I'm right. like, I, you know, I admire that go, you know, person that will just jump in because I've, you know, worked with young people and like, oh, no, I don't do that. And I'm like, oh, get her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel the same All way. All right, I'll do it. I, yeah, I can't impart uh, to people enough that that's how you learn. You know, on 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 a set, especially as low budget yeah. filmmaker, when you're first starting out, you yeah. do everything because you never yeah. know what you're going to learn. I'll tell you, my first job in show business. One summer, I was supposed to be a set designer at the Summerstock Theater, and they didn't open. So I was out of a job, like right before the summer break. And a friend of mine was working in New York at this costume house. He said, oh, I'll see if they have anything. Come in. So I went in and met them. They said, the only job we have opened is truck driver. Can you drive a truck? And I said, yes. <laughs> but I had no idea how to drive a truck. <laughs> and my dad, the weekend, like <laughs> borrowed a truck and <laughs> we were figuring out how to drive a truck. I killed no one driving in Manhattan a truck one summer. I didn't. I killed a bunch of mailboxes and... <laughs> Well, I think that's a really good a point to make. I mean, I I can't impart what you just said is one of I think the most important lessons to learn in Hollywood is that you always say yes, take the yeah. job, and you figure it out. Yes, <laughs> because it, so often there's a lot of people doing the same thing. So it's don't worry about it. Take yeah. the job, jump off the cliff. Yep, and uh, don't worry how high it is. <laughs> What's the worst thing that could happen? They'll fire you. Right. Exactly. Though that's a, that's also a, gr a great lesson. Now, what other what are some other things like as you're working with people, like working with a guy like Bob Mackey, yeah, who was a legend. Yes. When you start working with somebody like that, they can be intimidating. Yeah. Just because of who they are, and yeah. if, if you are aware of who they are, sometimes you get in your own way. But when you work with somebody like Bob Mackey, and a lot of people in the business will end up working with people they view to be mega stars yeah. or. What what are some lessons you could impart about that? Like, don't fear working, or maybe you should fear Bob Mackey. Yeah. I don't know. When you start working with somebody like that, how do you approach it? Like, how do you start? You learn, and you learn to know what he wants and to anticipate what he wants. And, you know, he was a workaholic. Uh, we work six days a week, many times seven. I would leave at 7.30 at night sometimes, and they go, oh, half day? And I'd, be, and I'd been there at seven o'clock in the morning, because uh, uh, they, you know, he was so busy. Right. I mean, he's talked about, you know, he said his thirties he doesn't remember because he never had a day off. Yeah, which is something that this business can can fill yeah. you up. And if you're yes. if you have a day off, you should be working on something else. Yeah. But I learned so much from them, and he and his partner Ray Agian, they could watch a movie from the sixties and name the extras. Oh my God. They're like, oh, we loved her. She had evening gowns and furs, and her husband had tails. You know, when they had dress extras, <laughs> and they came with their own clothes to be in a you know a contemporary movie. Wow! To be fancy people. Uh that, that I mean, it's amazing. So, you know, you've done so much. Is there something that you haven't done? Is there is there well, some? Of course, I want to do a musical. What kind of musical? Any kind. They might be coming back. I mean, I but... know. I'm hoping. I'm hoping somebody, some director I know. I was like John Lee Hancock, Jay Roach, do a musical. I could see John Lee Hancock doing a musical. So could I. Has... As a matter of fact, turned down a couple, and I'm, you know, still annoyed with him. <laughs> Come on, you got to be his cheerleader. Come on, John. If you're you listening to this it. podcast, you can do it. <laughs> he needs you to do that musical. Come on, come on. Now, me okay, let me ask you this: Would it be? Would you? Would Would you rather do something like Camelot, do a period musical, or go contemporary? Like, I have no. Um, I'd like to do any of them. Like Baz Luhrmann, do a Moulin yeah, Rouge. Yeah, <laughs> I do that. I do Camelot. I do, you know, a one character musical. Well, that would be interesting. Yeah. Like a Hedwig. Yeah. Do a Hedwig in the Angry Inch, you yeah. know? <laughs> Which, so I'm hoping. But yeah, I, I've i been very lucky in that I've not just done one kind of thing. Right. And I've gotten to do lots of different kinds of movies. Uh, 
Is there a subject matter that you haven't tackled that you want to just because the kind of clothes, besides a musical, but like- Well, one of the greatest experiences of my life was doing uh, the HBO version uh, of The Normal Heart, right? Okay. which I had seen the play in the 80s and it so affected me. I went back the next night and saw it again. Wow. And so to get that job was such a gift and to work with these actors, straight actors and gay actors, all you know, wanting to do the best job possible. Was that a job that you went after? Have you ever gone after a job? I have, but I usually don't get those. No, this job fell in my lap. I know Ryan Murphy's costume designer, and we're friends. And she called me and said, I just can't do it. And I really think that you'd be better at doing it anyway. Uh, wow. And the next day I had the job. What was that day for you like? I was so excited to 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 work on that film with Mark Ruffalo and yeah. Bomer and- a great cast. It was a great cast. Matter of fact, Matt Bomer's wearing Matt Bomer and Mark are wearing my jeans from the eighties <laughs> that were in the garage. <laughs> yeah, Matt Bomer wears these old beat up jeans of mine to go out on a date, and I'm like, Matt, you look better in those jeans than I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a very beautiful man. Hey, you know, yeah. it's hard to make him not look uh, good. Yeah. So when when you do something like that, when you yeah. get a job, do you ever feel intimidated? I was intimidated by that because I didn't want to screw it up and I didn't want the clothes to get in the way of the story. And we, you know, we had a really, it was great working with Ryan and the actors and we, we, we started, you know, it's all sort of fire Island and colorful right. and we made it darker and darker and darker and they all became warriors, all our characters and all their clothes got darker and stronger. And wow. And so there was a really wonderful progression with the production designer too. I really enjoyed working with him. That's a, re that's a really interesting way to go with, with, with that. Um, yeah. And that, that covers how many years is that, that about only about six years. Yeah. Only about six years, and we, I know, and these are other things. I love to give actors little things that you might not notice, mm. uh, like in Saving Mr. Banks, uh, uh, Emma's character wears her father's ring that uh, that he wears in the flashbacks, and she's got it on. Oh, uh, and it's just like a little thing that made her, you know, like connect the two stories, right? And then the same thing with um, with uh, the normal heart. Uh, Mark's lover has died, and he's. They were supposed to go to Yale together to the gay day at Yale, and I said to Mark, I said, "Oh, you should have this uh, coat on." And he said, "Really? Why?" I said, "Because it's his coat," and he just started to cry. Wow. And. I mean, when you do something like that- And nobody noticed it in the movie. You know, nobody mentioned it, that he's got his coat on walking to Yale and then has it over his lap when he's uh, inside. But I think that's why a costume designer is so important because you're you're bringing, people might not even know the kind of yeah. emotional truth that an yeah. actor is able to muster yeah. in his performance or her performance yeah. because of what you've done for them. Yeah, and I love to do those kind of things. And I think that that can't be undersold. I mean, what the relationship between a costume designer and an actor, yeah. it might not be something that even anybody's aware of, but the internal uh, emotion that comes out of it is something that you see on screen and it might be intangible, but it came out of that relationship yeah. the two of you guys had. Yeah, I, I, I love working with actors, uh, actors, real actors that you know are invested in the character. Right, well, because they- You know you're in trouble when you- first conversation with an actor and they say, oh, and in Armani, in Armani, I'm, you know, a 48. <laughs> Does that happen a lot? No. <laughs> but it happened once. I'm like, all right, but you're playing a lady who lives in a trailer. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I you, listen, I this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, I think uh, it's been a fantastic conversation, and I, I just—if there's anything—if there's anything you could leave us with, do you have a trick of the trade? Something that, th that you've learned over the years that 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 you've never told anybody, hmm. but a certain a certain little insight that. 
has served you well? I'm kind of an open book. I'll tell anybody anything. You know, I learned early on uh, when I first was starting, a, cost, a, a very gifted costume designer came and gave a lecture on how to go for an interview and present your portfolio. Mm. And I have to say, I changed the way I did and I immediately got a job. And I and he said one thing that was really, he said, you know, a lot of people go in and say, I'm not giving you my ideas till I'm hired. And he goes, those are ideas for this movie. So if they don't hire you, you can't use those ideas anyway. So just give them. Wow. And it's like, it's, yeah. and that's the truth. And it's the truth. You know, go in for an interview. If you really want the job, uh, when I went in to do Down With Love, I designed the whole movie. I brought in all, I brought in 30 sketches. Well, and that's an impeccably designed film. And a, one of the most fun times I ever had on a movie. Wow. With Renee Zellweger, who is the kindest, nicest. I mean, when she won her second Oscar last year, I was so excited for her. <laughs> uh, because there's not a kinder person working. Well, Daniel Orlandi, you, sir, this was a fantastic interview. I can't thank you enough for your time. And uh, what a fun, what a fun hour. It was my hour. pleasure. Oh. It was my pleasure. Well, our pleasure as well. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, I know you've got two movies that have, are upcoming that you've yes. designed. And what are those movies? Uh, a movie coming out later this year called The Guilty that Antoine Fuqua directed with um, Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm. And I just got back from Budapest where I was doing the film version of the video game Borderlands, which is going to be outrageous. And that was with Eli Roth. Eli Roth. Of hostile fame. Of and... hostile fame. Not at all like hostile. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but I hope not. Kate, you're, you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> Kate Blanchett and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, Kevin Hart. Wow, what a cast. Yeah, really great cast and outrageous, hilarious. Well, and I hope somebody gives Daniel a musical. One day. <laughs> One day. Well, thank you very much for being on the Designing Hollywood podcast. My pleasure. And thanks to our sponsor, the United American Costume Company. Since 1977, the American Costume Company has provided wardrobe for hundreds of motion picture and television projects. Their authentic collection is known worldwide to members of the industry and is easily distinguishable on screen. The United American Costume Company can dress your entire cast with an eye for detail and authenticity. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button. And you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.